I want to welcome George Mikowski to the Haight-Ashbury Video Oral History Project. My name is Rebecca Nichols and I will be moderator for this interview. Nice to see you. Pleasure. Um, I love your hair. It's grown a lot long. It's grown long. Which hair in particular? <laughs> um, uh, I've been told you're a native San Franciscan. Ooh, yeah, native. <laughs> Um, so, where were you born? Tell me a little about. About three blocks from here. We're on Haight Street. Yes. About three blocks away at St. Mary's Hospital on um, <clears throat> Stanion. Amazing. And uh, what, were your, what are your parents' names? Felicia and is my mom, and my dad um, is Joseph. He's uh, been dead for about 10 years or so. And, uh, what kind of work did your father do? Sheet metal worker. His father was a sheet metal worker. His father was a sheet metal worker. He was from Poland. My parents are both from Poland. They're Holocaust survivors. Wow. When did they arrive approximately in America? 1950. And I have two older brothers. And they what? were born in Russia. Ah. And I'm the only one born in America, America. in my family. Yeah. What's your brother's names? Henry and Jerry. Um, I know we're going to talk a little bit later about some of the work you've done, and uh, but I know you have a CD out about San Francisco, and uh, I think there was a photo of your mother. Um, can we possibly take a close-up? Yeah, this is a, a CD I put out just a little while ago, and it's um, it's called San Francisco. Just what the cover looks like, and it was done by Alton Kelly, who's. Uh, Really well known artist. He was partners with Stanley Mouse for many years. And uh, Kelly probably did the first posters ever. Sure. And he created the family dog originally. And uh, he's a legendary guy, a great guy. He's a sweetheart. He and, yeah, a great guy, a great artist. And uh, so this album, San Francisco, is um, a musical soundtrack to the city. I wrote a song for every neighborhood that. Hopefully the music sounds like where you are. Captures the heart of the area. Yeah. I know I know you did a little tribute to your mother, Felicia, and I think she's photographed somewhere. My mom is on the back cover. Wonderful. Tell us a little about that. Sitting shot. anonymously next to me on this bench here. There she is. Amazing. She's my best buddy. She's well, I know her too, and she's a wonderful lady. Wonderful, wonderful yeah, lady. She's pretty cosmic. Uh, and him, you know, uh, when I was a kid and, I, and had gotten grounded, uh, the BM was happening that week, and she wanted to go herself, so that's <laughs> how I got to go, you know, because she wanted to go bad, and, like, I wasn't about to stay home, so we both went, and that was the first time she ever saw me smoke pot, because <laughs> it, it was uh, about 13 or 14, sure. and I'm 52 now. And, but what was great was, see, I have two older brothers, and they, they are a lot older than me, seven well, and ten names? years older. What are their names? Henry is seven years older, and Jerry's ten years older. And they had already been smoking before that, but they were a lot older. My mom had never seen me do it. She didn't even know if I did. And we're sitting there, and we're watching, you know, <laughs> The Grateful Dead, and Quicksilver, and, and Allen Ginsberg, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and all this, and, and this guy, you know, next we just passes me a lit joint. And my mom's looking at me going, well, like, what are you gonna do with that anyway? <laughs> I start smoking and what's she gonna do? Yell at me in front of 60,000 of me? <laughs> what's she gonna do? <laughs> so that was a pretty uh, amazing day in many respects. So you didn't actually live in the Haight-Ashbury, but you lived in San Francisco and spent yeah. a lot of time here. Well, for a lot of reasons. What were a, reasons? I wasn't home. Right. You know, when you're a kid, you don't want to hang out at home. No. And uh, B, you know, for a little kid about 13 or 14, it's really cool, all these girls like with no bras on. It's like a really <laughs> big deal for me. And uh, that was a big attraction for me. And I'd be here every day after school. Sure. And uh, also, I like the, I like everything about it. I like the artwork. The music, the uh, the smell—I'll never forget. There was a certain smell. Everything smelled like 
patchouli and that vinegar on the uh, <laughs> right on the fish and chips. Right. Remember? That's right. Yeah, because there was that place Foghorn, fish and chips on uh, up the off corner the, off for Main twenty five cents. Get a bag like this of fries. Yeah. And everybody and you pour like a you know gigantic amount of vinegar on it. Somehow that smell of vinegar and patchouli that's will stick with you forever. Yeah, well, smell will stick with you. Well, you, you, you just, the timing was right. You were at the right age, and there well, was a playground right there for you. Yeah, well, I was a musician, but I, I was a serious classical pianist. And I was actually pretty well known. When did you start playing music? When, when I was, I started, started, I gave my first concert at the age of four at the San Francisco main library. Wow. And, um, Great story. My mom was so excited. Leaving <laughs> leaving the house, she fell and broke her leg. Oh my goodness. But didn't go to the hospital until after the recital. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's my mom for you. Amazing. Um, <laughs> I know one of these stories, one of these days when uh, the legendary Warlocks Grateful Dead pulled a flatbed truck along the uh, Schrader and they closed the streets and there was a sea of people. Um, you were there that day. Yeah, um, luckily I didn't know and I don't think anybody did. It was a spur of the moment thing and, and I just used to like to go hang out at the Grateful Dad's house because they were always, well, Jerry Garcia taught me how to roll a joint there <laughs> and there were always Guys, you know, they would get like good kilos of weed, and there'd be like 10 guys and girls, and everybody just sitting around the table was rolling joints all the time. And I still, to this day, roll them on the table because Jerry had that missing finger. You know, right. he didn't roll them up like that, he did it like this, and so I still do it you that still way. Do it yeah. way. <laughs> but so that day, uh, I just, you know, it was a nice sunny day, and I woke up and went to Haight Street, and uh, and there was a lot of activity around the Grateful Dead's house at Where 710 that? Ashbury. And, 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 and a lot of activity. And what happened was, was they were renting the flatbed trucks and the generators. And they were, it was a guerrilla concert. They had no permits, no rights of any sort. They just said, sure. we're going to go play on Haight Street. Right. Once we close it up, what can they do? So they put the two flatbed trucks together and created a long stage. And and just started playing. But I had walked to the destination of the gig from their house with Pigpen. And and I was a kid and he was a really scary looking guy. Yeah. <laughs> but he was like the nicest guy in the world. He, he was sure. like not scary at all when you started talking to him. Right. And, and, and the dichotomy I thought was really great. You know, and, and, and I remember the, his girlfriends were all calling him Piggy and Right. And you know these cute little names, and here's this really tough guy just going, "Oh, shucks," you know. And <laughs> I thought he was a great guy, and, yeah. and also that that was the first time Jerry Garcia had ever worn glasses wow. in public, and that was a big deal. He didn't have a beard at that point. So you you, you was going through a book, and well, no, this um, there were a lot of pictures um, and photographers. Jim Marshall was there, and. The Dead came out with an album called Live Dead a little later. It was a pretty sure. famous album. Yes. And on the insert, when you open up the album, was this picture. And I'm looking at the picture, and I remember I was there. So I started that is looking the day we're the talking picture. about right now. And, uh, Street theater up. Here I am, right here. Let's do a close right up. Above Let's... my finger. And how, old, how old are you there? There I am. Oh, there you am with the black glasses. All right. <laughs> I was about 14 years old there. Amazing. And here I'm right in the front watching right. the band. And that was a great, great day. That's a great day. And I see here the straight theater is all open. Yeah, uh, straight Alton theater. Joy, right, right here. Charlie and, Musselwhite. And all the <coughs> Phoenix. kids playing, there was hardly any way you could this stop that. This street went all the way down. This is at Stanion, the Schrader, and we're taking the view all the way back to Masonic. Yeah, let's see. Here, let's back up here on this picture here. And we can see look at the now? street view. There you go. Look at all the people. It starts at Schrader and goes all the way back, all the way and to the top. there's Jerry with his glasses on for the first time. Amazing. We'll do a close-up on I Jerry. I was looking at Pigpen. 
is not in this picture. In the shot, no. But there's Jerry. First time glasses. There he is, yeah. And There's a red flannel shirt he was wearing. So many people can look at this and find themselves in there. I, have, I know a few friends that claim to be in this picture. I, I'm, I was there that day, so I just, I'm not going to get a magnifying glass Right, it, it's like a looking at an aerial shot of Woodstock exactly. and trying to find yourself. Yeah, but, that is uh, such a great shot because it's yeah. so typical of what it looked like when those exactly. days happened and then the police would come around 6 o'clock and chase everybody away right. at 5 and the straight theater doors would open wide and everybody would run for refuge inside the straight theater, you know. That's an that's a amazing shot. So, um, through the, and that that's what, about 1967 or so. So, you were at the Human Being? Yeah. And any time there was a concert in the park? Everyone. Everyone. Um, well, I mean, it wasn't anything I would plan because the band said he would plan it. Sure. I would, you know, just by virtue of being there, you were there. Exactly. And, and you know, when, when I was a kid, you know, like 13, 14, 15 years old, I mean, where else am I going to hang out? Best playground. I mean, in the '60s, Haight Ashbury. This was a magical place at a magical time, and, and cannot be recreated no matter how hard you try. It was the innocence is the greatest thing that I remember of it because we were all like pioneers. We had no role models. Right. It was like we were all everything we did was for the first time. Exactly. We were all jumping off the cliff together. Sure. And didn't know if there was a parachute underneath or, or, or a trampoline or, or a wet rag or, or <laughs> right. anything. We just a assume bunch of rocks. Uh, yeah, who knew what acid would do to you? Who knew what it, the, the whole lifestyle would do to you? Who were who was some, during that period, uh, did you ever, ever know uh, besides any other musicians besides the dead? Did you know Grant Jacobs, the photographer? There are a lot of people living yeah. in the neighborhood. Um, uh, well, Quicksilver, Big Brother. Being a kid at that time, I didn't really know the big guys. They didn't want to hang out with me. Sure. You know, Jerry Garcia was about the only guy who was nice to me at all. The rest of them could care less. I was just right. in their way. Right. You know, but uh, as I got older, then you know, then the age levels out. Right. Exactly. You know, and, and it doesn't matter so much. Sure. You're all the same size, and your hair is all the same length at that point. Sure. And you're all. You know, Doesn't matter. And so then I would Meet become friends people. with the musicians and the artists. But as a kid, I just looked up to them and, and, of course. and uh, couldn't really get near hanging with them. Sure. Well, like say it was a, nor <laughs> it was a, day, a normal day on Hate Street and you were coming out of school and you're walking down the street. Um, you pick up some fish and chips on the corner. You might run well, down the street and uh, there were places like the drugstore cafe, the psychedelic shop, uh, the boot hook. Um, any memories of walking down Haight Street in well, those days? For me, I had a purpose and that was I loved the posters. So I would come to Haight Street and collecting posters was my kind of mission. Right. And while collecting posters you go into all the shops, you meet everybody, blah, sure. blah, blah. But as a kid, I, I loved them, and I would go into the stores and say, hey, you know, when the gig's over, can I call dibs on that poster? And sure. then I'd go there next week and take it out the window. And, sure. and then I think it was on Tuesdays, every Tuesday at about 4 o'clock or so, a truck would come up to the psychedelic shop with the new Fillmore and Avalon posters, and there'd be stacks of them. And so uh, me and the other kids from school, we'd be sure to be there on that day. And, uh, they had the little flyers. They had flyers, well, you know, say take one, we take a hundred. Sure. <laughs> Did you ever take a poster off a pole? That was we took them in? off poles, we took them out of stores when we weren't supposed to. We <laughs> took them out of, I mean, you know, sure. if they were up, we took them. You know, um, I had a memory, when the poster came out and they pinned them on the poles, you always had a crowd of people standing around. Because everybody's trying right. to figure out, what did they say? Right, right. Yeah, that experience. Uh, uh, where um, the poster art was great, but you could hardly read them you know, right. at that time. Well, that yeah. was kind of the fun. Yeah. It was like a secret code. Right. I, like, we could only read them, our parents couldn't figure them out. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that um, was great. This CD that you did has a, uh, as you, uh, it's an amazing CD. I want to congratulate you on it. It's a wonderful piece. Um, and every neighborhood is represented. 
um, this piece that you did on the Haight Ashbury. Can you tell me a little bit about what inspired you to go the direction you did when you created that? Yeah. Um, and then I'd love to hear it. Let me put this song here. The Haight Ashbury song. Okay. Hey, look at this. Through modern science here. <laughs> we can. All of a sudden, now this thing's going backwards. Okay, here we go. All right, here comes the Haight Ashbury song. What inspired you to? This is a basic acid trip. Your basic LSE trip. It starts out here with some nice kind of piano music. It's kind of early in the morning. I'm looking out the window. It's a really nice day. I think I'm going to take some acid and go on down to Haight Street. Now I come on down to Haight Street. It's kind of mysterious. The acid's just starting to kick in now. Here comes the first rush. And this goes on here for a while. Kind of a meditative state. Kind of getting high, kind of coming to. All the colors are getting a little bit brighter now. <laughs> Everything's starting to get kind of goofy. I think I see David Nelson. <laughs> I think I see George Mikowski. <laughs> and what happens? This goes on for a bit. And then rather abruptly. The acid kicks in the high gear here. You're just full blown. And everything is moving. Who's on this recording? Yeah. That's Harvey Mandel on the guitar solo right there. He's one of the finest psychedelic guitar players in the world, I think. My hate Ashbury tribute. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So on on this city that you did, you do Chinatown, you do North Beach, each with the flavor of it, the area. Uh, um, introducing the North Beach song of Lawrence Furman Getty. Wonderful. And um, I have the authentic sounds of the foghorns and the uh, sea lions of Pier 39 and the church bells at Mission Dolores on the missions. Song and, um, and, and I, the artists and all the musicians are all San Francisco. Wow. Um, everybody who appears is, um, from, you know, I have a member of the Charlatans, uh, Richard Olson plays on one song, Super. Martin Fierro plays on one, Kathy McDonald appears, um, Lauren Rowan, <clears throat> Harvey Mandel, all San Francisco artists. Everything is. In San Francisco as it could be. Do you, do you have a website? Or yeah. What is your website? GeorgeMikowski.com. GeorgeMikowski. Can you spell Mikowski for us? Let me see. <laughs> M I C H A L S K I. George Mikowski. Dot is, you don't have to write D O T. Just dot. <laughs> Beautiful. Com, not C A L M, just C O M. Well, I want to lower that a little. That's an incredible treat. Thank you so much. Um, I want to learn a little bit more of what you're doing now and what you've done a little bit in the, in the past. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time, but we don't want to miss some of this stuff. Um, when uh, you were, uh, you had met Don Johnson. And tell me some of the, the growing history, Don Johnson. Well, that was in my L.A. years. Yes. And um, I, um, well, going to L.A. was a whole trip in itself, because in San Francisco, I'd been playing with uh, Michael Bloomfield. He taught me how to play the blues, actually. And then 
I began recording with Blue Cheer and two thirds of the original Blue Cheer and I went down to Los Angeles and we started a band called Foxtrot and we were the house band of the Whiskey A Go Go and the Starwood and then we were the first white band signed to Motown Records which was kind of a trip wow. for us. And, um, what year was that around? The 1973. 73. Amazing. Yeah, and then um, after that, I, I teamed up with a partner of mine, Nikki Osterveen, and we uh, did a really nice album on Columbia Records. Uh, but we gained a lot of notoriety for our songwriting, mostly for Barbara Streisand. We wrote a lot of songs for her. Anything and, that we know? Well, I wrote a song for her called A Man I Love, which is on her Greatest Hits album. So right. if you're a Barbra Streisand fan, you would probably know that song. Immediately. And, um, and uh, I did the music for a couple movies with her. I did a Main Event and Eyes of Laura Mars. And, um, Songbird? Or, uh... Yeah, well, I have a song on the Songbird album. And, um, and uh, let's see. Um, and then right around after that time, I met Don Johnson, who at the time was um, just a struggling artist, not at all famous. And we got along really well together. Why, I don't know, but we did. You know, he, when I first met him, he came in the room and he was wearing white tennis shorts and a tennis outfit and a sweater tied around his neck. And I looked like... I'd just come from an audition for Kiss or something. Right, <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, but we go along really well immediately. We ended up becoming best friends. And then I did a lot of work with him musically because he's very musical. Then when he moved up here to San Francisco to do Nash Bridges, he hired me as the music director for the show. So that was a good six year run. It gave you some freedom in that show to be able yeah. to. Well, the best part was Bring the music I was able to use San Francisco acts and I used unsigned acts, which no network show has ever done. Sure. And I used 50 unsigned acts from San Francisco because I wanted the show to be authentic. When you sure. walk into a nightclub, I wanted a real San Francisco it's band to be playing there. Sure. And real San Francisco music as often as possible. So that was a great. Did your break. show ever sh shoot through the hate at all? Was there any, oh, yeah. any segments that happened? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Hate? We did shoot in the hate, and um, we did a scene with uh, Cheech at the uh, Cannabis Club. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was Cheech and Chong. Perfect. Had teamed up back together for that Perfect. episode. Perfect. Perfect. And I put the music to that. And I used uh, Gary Duncan from Quicksilver oh, wow. on guitar because I wanted the authentic psychedelic sound, right? Pothead music, exactly. It was <laughs> super. And then um, you did some stuff for Fame, and you uh, also yeah, Kids from Fame did a song of mine called Rock and Roll World. It was a title song in their album. It was a huge hit in Europe. And, uh, and I know you're responsible for doing some stuff with. Uh, Famous mimist, uh, Robert oh, Shields. Shields. Yeah, yeah, Shields and Yarnell. They're great. Amazing. Yeah, Robert Shields started, you know Robert. Very well, yes. And he started here in San Francisco in Union Square. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I was their music director for about 10 years. We traveled around the world, and we opened for Sinatra for a year, and uh, that was a great time. They're so talented. Very you know? talented. And then they got their own television show. Yeah, we had our own TV series. Exactly. The uh, oh, thing wow. they put us on opposite Laverne and Shirley, and that wow. killed us. They were like the biggest show at the time. Right. But um, <laughs> it was a great experience. I mean, God, Robert's extremely talented. Great artist. It was... Okay, so um, I also know that um, there was this um, national tour uh, and uh, a legendary group, Black Tide. Oh, God, yeah. Can you tell me? That was a great band. I, it was kind of cool story. I went and saw this band called Black Tide, and they had Randy Meisner on bass from the Eagles, who wrote and sang Take It to the Limit, and Billy Swan was in the group who wrote and sang, I can help if you got a problem and don't know what it is, I can help. Right. And Jimmy Griffin, who was in the group Bread and wrote all those great songs and sang them with David Gates. And um, Blondie Chaplin, who's now with the Rolling Stones. He right. was in the band, he sang Blondie, Sailor on Sailor Blondie. for yeah. the Beach Boys. 
And uh, David Kemper on drums, who was with the Jerry Garcia band, That's right. then he was with Bob Dylan for 10 years after that. And uh, I mean, so this was an amazing band. And I went and saw them and I go, God, I would love to play with these guys. And then two days later, their manager calls me up and says, well, they're going on the road and they need a keyboard player. You want to come play? And I go, I'm there. So we did a national tour and it was phenomenal. Four of the guys in the group had sung a number one song. So it was amazing to sprinkle our set with, you know, these hits and we had amazing four part harmonies. Oh, what a band. It was great. I know. And there's, what no, there's no way in this video to fit it all in, but there's a few things I don't want to forget. Um, and we will well, be asking. What's really cool upcoming is uh, Mayor Gavin Newsom in June. We're in the middle of May right now. Yes. Uh, in a couple weeks is appointing me as the chairman of the music task force to um, bring back the music scene in San Francisco. Because um, since Bill Graham has died, we have no music scene. In fact, we don't even have a BAMI awards anymore. You know, San Francisco has always had music awards celebrating our Both local Calvin musicians. The That's gone music. by the yeah. wayside. Yeah. Um, Musicians used to come here from all around the world. Now they're leaving here, going to LA, they're going everywhere else. There's no more concerts in the parks all the time. They're, the band shelf sits empty. So I went to the mayor and I said, why don't we do something about this? Let's, let's make revitalize totally. the whole scene. Has and and, and make it where people come from all over the world to come back here for the music. That's right. And make it where young bands can have a chance to break. And so we can showcase them in the band show, and a lot of people can come and see them, and then they'll see they're playing somewhere, and they can be a young bands can gain a following. Of course, and, and it's there's getting so some much of the, to be done. It's getting some of the politics out of the way, so it can well, happen. Yeah, the, the politics sport. gets in the way of everything, and, right. and and we should be embracing that we are the city of love and peace. That's right. Just as France is the city of lights. I mean, Paris of course. is the city of lights. Exactly. And, 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 you know, New York is the big apple. Or Every city has a thing that like my heart grab onto. Yeah. And, and I said to the mayor, I said, why run away from love and peace? Right. I mean, that's what we are. And that's we're right. the city. The bee-in was here. That's right. The summer of love is here. Exactly. This is, why run from that? That's a great Build thing. Build on it. So yes. let's let's take that on with pride. That's so right, that's right. he's given me the full city backing to do these events, to have a summer of love. So Chet doesn't have to walk around with his hand out asking people to back him, to raise money, so you don't have to like how you right. did your last event, pay out of your own pocket and go crazy right. to right. put an event together. Right. The city should be behind that yeah. because it's great for the city. Exactly. Well, it's gonna be happening now and I'm very excited about that. So um, uh, we have I, a lot of great things upcoming. Uh, I know this video is about the past. It's what we want but to bring the past the video into the and present. The present and the future are all related. Exactly. And had I not been in the hate to see what happened then, I would not know what to do now. Exactly. And well, I have a question. Having been here, it's very apparent. It's like, let's bring it you. back. If this video is watched 50 years from now, some young people are watching this and have heard some of your experiences. If nothing more, what would you like? Uh, in other words, the world would take your advice. If what people, advice would you give? If kids are watch us in 50 years, I would like for them to just be absolutely amazed that we had a hard time bringing music out to the streets, right. to people everywhere, right. all the time. Exactly. I would hope in 50 years from now there's music everywhere for free and for people to enjoy. It, it heals people. It, it, uh, can meet, it, it joins you know, people. If, if, it, kids, if kids get into music, they don't grow up to be who looks. That's right. That's right. Well, I want to so much thank you for being here. Right. Um, you, you've added... Uh, your, your All right, where's my money? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> your music you've created and brought, brought on board and has entertained so many people. It's just the beginning for you. We wish you the best. And, Thanks a lot. Uh, I wish you gonna, the best too. We're going to be calling you back. And in life and, and, and health. And, really? and I hope all the old hippies come out and talk to you about their experiences. Oh, everybody is. We have an amazing. Someday you'll only be hearing rumors about what happened. Exactly. 
it just had to be there, but at least we got to document some of it while we can tell it our way. And thank you, George Mikowski. Thank you, George, my friend, um, right. for being part of this and being part of our family. Thanks, Troya.